The police department here in Colleen is describing this entire massacre as a very complicated jigsaw puzzle, and they don't have all the pieces. Channel 8's Robert Riggs has been with the Colleen Police Department all day long and joins us now live. Robert, this has been the big question, the continuing question. What was the motive for the shooting? Do police think they'll ever have an answer to that? Chip, that looks very doubtful right now. Colleen police say they may never determine why the deceased gunman attacked this crowded cafeteria. Federal ATF agents have traced the two semi to nine millimeter semi-automatic handguns uh, that were used in the killings. George Hennard purchased the weapons earlier this year in Henderson, Nevada, where his mother lives. Both guns were registered with the Las Vegas Police Department. Hennard emptied a half dozen ammunition clips that were capable of holding 100 bullets. Police say no narcotics were found in Hennard's pickup truck or at his home. But all the, the only thing we recovered were some notes and um, I'd call them like memos. There was nothing recovered to this point that would indicate he was capable or intended to do anything similar to what he's done. The Department of Public Safety is praising the courageous response of five of its officers yesterday. Those officers happened to be next door teaching a seminar to Colleen police on auto theft prevention. They were outside during a break, heard the cries of a woman, ran to their cars, got their weapons, and then intervened. They are credited with pinning down the gunman and stopping the killing spree. Well, four are officers that work out of Hearst, and the other is based in Waco. The people who were involved in this incident yesterday are involved in uh, motor vehicle theft interdiction, and uh, we basically work on organized uh, theft rings. You can, some people can go their whole career without being involved in a situation like that. However, it's, it's, uh, uh, they're, they're paid to deal with the, the most hardened elements of society, so uh, and they're armed all the time and, and uh, are expected to meet the threat uh, whenever it's made to the public. The office officers were shaken by what they saw and encountered inside this cafeteria. They've been placed on light duty. One officer described the scene of victims huddled and hiding under tables as a covey of quail waiting to be killed. It appears tonight that the motive for these killings may go to the grave with George Pennard. Chip. All right, thank you very much, Robert. The president of the San Antonio-based Luby's restaurant chain, Pete Ur it's a goodwill gesture to help resolve the hostage crisis. And closer to home, authorities say Killeen gunman George Hennard was not on drugs, nor did he have a brain tumor. Today, they released the autopsy results of the man responsible for the worst shooting mass murder in U.S. history. Also today, police officers who were involved in the shootout with the gunman from Belton spoke out for the first time. General H. Robert Riggs joins us now from Killeen with that story. Robert? Chip, those three officers told a very dramatic story today. To recap, at 1240 last Wednesday, two of the officers who were working undercover had just finished a drug bust and they were taking a seized vehicle to the pound when the call came in. They arrived here in about a minute. One officer said that he got here before he could even get his seatbelt fastened. Next door, there happened to be more officers that were going to an auto prevention theft seminar. One of those officers heard the cries for help, ran to his car, got his revolver, and ran over here to assist. When they arrived in the ditch where I'm standing, they found people huddled down, hiding, some people running across the highway, screaming for help. One of the officers said when he smelled the stench of gunpowder in the air, he knew something bad was happening. The three Colleen police investigators who confronted the gunman are still shaken by the mass killing. One says the dining room was a battlefield of carnage. Another worried his wife might be among the victims because she frequently ate at the cafeteria. After drawing fire, Officer Ken Olson shot back, hitting the gunman. 35-year-old George Hennard flinched but did not fall. An ensuing gun battle pinned Hennard behind an alcove entry to the bathroom. Hennard claimed to have hostages, but officers saw none and heard a scared tone in the gunman's voice. Later, a single shot rang out. The officer's brave charge under fire saved countless people from the cold-blooded killing spree. We didn't have time to think about fear. We saw those people being hurt and dead. We had to do something. We had to stop this man. 
I wouldn't say that we wasn't scared. We probably were, but at the time, we didn't have time to think about that. It was just like that. We had to do something. An autopsy performed on Leonard has found no trace of, or, of uh, bloods or, uh, in his blood of drug or alcohol. There was no brain tumor found. Leonard's father had claimed that he might have a brain tumor like Charles Whitman, the UT Tower sniper, did back in the 60s. Uh, they did find that Leonard was hit by two bullets from officer's gun and he suffered four wounds from those bullets. Uh, Leonard died of a self-inflicted gunshot to the head. And the officers here are now trying to put together a timeline of Hennard's movements from months ago up until the time that he drove his pickup truck through the front plate glass window of this cafeteria. But they're still saying they may never know the motive. Chip? All right. Thank you very much, Robert. Meanwhile, another victim of the Colleen massacre was buried today. This one, a soldier... found the delay could be three to six weeks. The two agencies meet Wednesday to talk it over. Brad Watson, Channel 8 News. Autopsy reports on the man responsible for last week's shooting massacre in Colleen show George Hennard was not under the influence of drugs and that he did not have a brain tumor. Meanwhile, the police officers who put a stop to George Hennard's killing spree talked publicly about the ordeal. And Robert Riggs is with Starcam 8 in Colleen with the update. Robert? Gloria, at 12.40 p.m. last Wednesday, police radios in Colleen crackled with a report that there was a shooting at the Luby's cafeteria. Two undercover officers were just coming off a drug bus. They heard the call. Next door at the Sheridan, an officer from the auto theft division was attending a seminar on auto theft. He heard the call. The trio was here less than a minute. When they arrived in the ditch where I'm standing, they found people fleeing the lubies and hiding and screaming. One officer said he was knew it was serious when uh, three soldiers, soldiers bolted by him and he heard gunshots. The air here was filled with the smell of gunpowder. Well, their quick response is credited with saving many lives, but they claim they're not heroes. They say they didn't have time to think about fear. They just had to do something. And it was just as bad as Vietnam. And it brought back memories as I went in there to remember the time that I was in Vietnam because I saw it. And it, it was gross. A trio of Colleen police officers are trying to cope with the emotional trauma of confronting the cafeteria gunman and the battlefield carnage of victims. Undercover officers Charles Longwell and Ken Olson drew the first shots. Inside, 35-year-old George Hadar stopped stalking and executing diners. Investigator Olson believes his first shots fired from behind an outside column hit Hennard. Hennard flinched but did not fall. He seemed to be in control. He's the bad guy. You know, the, the, you know he's in control. Once I fired that shot, it changed him totally. He was now not in control any longer. And you could see a sense of fear in him. But it, there was a crazed, it was a crazed fear. Olson and Longwell charged in the shattered plate glass window that the gunman had rammed his pickup truck through. Auto theft investigator Alex Morris followed. The three took cover. An ensuing gun battle pinned down Hennard, who fled inside an alcove entry to the bathroom. Officers say Hennard yelled profanities and vowed never to give up. The gunman nervously claimed to have a hostage. He did not have a hostage because he was concentrating on us too much to have hostages for him to look around the corner and at the same time fire around. If he had hostages, he would have had them right there in front of him, not behind him. Another volley of gunfire ended with a lone shot. Hennard killed himself. Only then did officers realize that 22 people hiding beneath tables were not moving. I walked around and started looking at the faces of the dead, and half the people that I thought should have gotten up didn't. That's really when I had time to be scared, and, 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 it, and that's really when the emotionalism crept up for me. Investigators are now trying to reconstruct Hennard's movements from months ago up until the day last Wednesday when he drove his pickup truck through the front plate glass window of Luby's. And police say they may never know the motive for why Hennard committed a mass shooting that has left 23 people dead. Gloria. Thank you, Robert. And another victim of the Killeen massacre was fondly remembered today at four. Good. Many of our problems at home and in the larger world are also opportunities.
In the spirit of Texas, WFAA-TV, News 8 presents Quinn Matthews, Lisa McCree, and Scott Sams. This is News 8 Midday. It was just um, a horrible experience, and um, I don't know why my life was spared and so many was killed, because everybody I know was just praying fervently. The day after the tragedy in Colleen, the surviving victims, the town, and the nation ask a single question, why? The aftermath of the massacre in Colleen tops our news this midday. Authorities are trying to piece together just what led to yesterday's massacre, the worst single-day shooting in the nation's history. The site of the tragedy, Alubi's Cafeteria, is along Highway 190 in the central Texas town of Colleen. Channel 8's Robert Riggs is live in Colleen now with the latest developments. Robert? Lisa, police are now trying to determine why a very angry young man chose this Luby's cafeteria to turn it into a deadly shooting gallery near this time yesterday. As you look over my shoulder here, you can see the uh, blinds, uh, the drapes uh, flap flapping in the wind. That's where he drove his pickup truck through as the cafeteria was packed with people. Police removed that pickup earlier today. To recap what happened, the gunman drove his truck into the cafeteria then coldly, calmly got out of the truck and began going table to table, executing his victims. Twenty-two people died in the carnage. Uh, police say that they are puzzled by his motivation for doing this. They have been collecting some information into a psychological profile that is giving them some tips as to what may have been his motivation. Police also say that there does not appear to be any ties between the deceased gunman and employees or dining patrons at Luby's. Colleen Police Chief held up the first photo of 35-year-old George Hennard. The former Merchant Marines bizarre threatening behavior had struck fear in his Belton neighborhood. Hennard had recently written two young women in which he referred to white, treacherous female vipers from those two towns who tried to destroy me and my family. Inside the Luby's cafeteria, police found Hennard armed with two semi-automatic 9mm handguns, a Glock 17 and a Ruger P89. Hennard had three ammunition magazines for each gun capable of holding a total of nearly 100 rounds. It appears Hennard may have fired 67 shots before turning a gun on himself. Police have been interviewing family and anyone who knew Hennard for clues to his emotional state. The main thing that, uh, that you all need to understand is, is liking this whole thing to a jigsaw puzzle. We're still in the process of collecting pieces of that puzzle, trying to put them together. We currently cannot tell you how successful we are going to be. We have found information at the residence that may help us. Police are not disclosing exactly what that information is. They do say that the, thus far they have been unsuccessful in retracing the path of the gunman before he drove his pickup truck into the cafeteria. Today, the top executives of Luby's converged on this community to console the victims and the grieving families. They're also setting up a trust fund in their um, honor to memorialize them. Channel 8's Michael Hill is standing by live with a report. Robert, it was a very emotional news conference, conference for the president and CEO of Luby's Cafeteria. He sniffled and his eyes seemed to water as he spoke and expressed his grief this morning. Let's take a look at what happened uh, this morning. Pete Urban arrived in Killeen yesterday, just about two hours after the murderous rampage here at Luby's Cafeteria. Later, he visited the crime scene, not allowed in the restaurant, though, but he said he stood there yesterday and thought of the senselessness of it all. This morning, Urban said Luby's had given $100,000 to an assistance fund for the victims and their families. He also said HEB-based San, An HEB San Antonio-based uh, food stores had given $10,000 and promised to give food in the next couple of days. Urban said he found the support system in Colleen incredible. Will the restaurant built in February of 1990 close as the McDonald's did in 1984 in California? Urban said he didn't know. He said his corporation's main concern is dealing with the victims and their families. Here's what he said. Let me start with saying that all of us at Luby's extend our condolences and our heartfelt sympathy to the families 
and friends of those who were killed or injured in this senseless tragedy. In the face of such mindless violence, I can only add my own sense of personal grief and my absolute assurance that we are making every effort to help the victims and their families. It seems had it not been for his prepared statement this morning, Mr. Irvin would have been at a loss for words even 24 hours after this, after this murderous rampage, as we said. Uh, Robert, uh, his uh, organization will be in the community the next couple of days, making sure that the victims, survivors, and their families are taken care of. Michael, thank you. The Colleen School District is suffering from the loss of three administrators who were dining here. Ana Martinez has been talking to school officials. Anna, this is a school system that had uh, prepared in uh, depth for the grief that it expected from Desert Storm and the victims that came back. Is that helping get them through this loss? That is one thing they are saying, Robert, that if it were not for all the preparation they had done for tragedy that really never hit here because of De Desert Storm, they would not have been able to deal with it as well as they are dealing with this tragedy right now, although they are having a very hard time bearing up, understandably. While all of Colleen is in mourning, perhaps nowhere has the loss been as profound as within the Colleen Independent School District. Three administrators were killed yesterday, two were injured, and numerous others narrowly escaped injury. Today, the flag in front of the Independent School District building is flying at half-mast. The school superintendent describes his district as being in shock. Pat Carney worked in the administration building as the director of elementary curriculum. She just started that job this year, but she'd worked with the district for 27 years. Ruth Pujo was a Chapter 1 Parent Advisory Coordinator. She'd been with the district 13 years. She's the lady you see here with the green dress and holding the purse. We don't have a picture of the third victim yet, Nancy Stansbury, who was a Chapter 1 supervisor. She worked with the district 19 years. We will try to get you that picture. The district superintendent says the women were more than just employees. They were friends. And in that message, I was saying there are really three groups of people. One, the ones that lost their lives and their families. That's a, you know, reaching out to them. The second group of the injured that are still in hospitals. The third group of those who witnessed uh, through that horror and will bear those scars. So we have all of those people. And then, of course, we're just one small part of the picture of the Killing School District because our community is hurting and a lot of people who went through trauma. And they'll never be the same. There were two people also injured yesterday at Luby's. James Swift and Joanne Hecathon were also administration employees. They were injured, but the superintendent says they are doing fine today. They are still in the hospital, though. A number of other district employees were at Luby's because it was boss's, boss's day. They were taking their bosses out to lunch. Many of those people witnessed their friends and co-workers being killed. There is a lot of trauma going on within the district today. Crisis teams are visiting each school trying to help the teachers, the students, and the witnesses deal with this grave tragedy. Robert? Anna, one thing I wanted to add. There was a 19-year-old worker at this cafeteria who had been unaccounted for. This morning, suddenly, he came running out of the cafeteria. He had been hiding inside the commercial dishwasher overnight in fear, not being sure whether or not it was safe to come out. All night long. All night. Also, city officials have asked that Governor Ann Richards please come to the community to show her support in this time of agony. Memorial services are planned for tomorrow, and the pastors here tell me that it's, it's time to try to get on with the healing process. Quinn. All right, thanks, Robert. The uh, bodies of the massacre victims, along with the body of Hennard, arrived at Dallas County's Forensic Science Institute.